Greetings today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We welcome our visitors. And we're just glad to have you here with us in our service today. And you listening out in the radio listening audience most certainly appreciates you tuning in Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be an inspiration to everyone. And you in the radio listening audience, if you call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour. We certainly appreciate it because we want to be a blessing to as many people as possible and we appreciate you doing that. Take your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 5, will you please? Let me remind you, this is a faith ministry. I look to you that love God to help me take care of the radio expense. Romans 5 is found on page 1197 in the original Scofield Reference Bible. I have five Bibles left. That is five original Scofield Reference Bible. I have four of the regular size. And I have one of the real large print Scofield. Occasionally somebody wants one with a real large print, and I have one. Of course, a little more expensive than the others, but I can uh, uh, give you savings on either one of the Bibles, as much as $10 or more. If you're interested in getting the original Scofield Reference Bible, I, I appreciate that Bible because you'll always find the same chapter and verse and the same page number in each one that you get. And I can give you the page number when you're turning to my text. And that way you can find it much quicker. Like today, the page number is 1197 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. If you're interested in that Bible, let me know. I'm not in the Bible sending business. I've mentioned many times I try to pick up a few during the year to have them around Christmas time. Uh, people might get a little saving, get one, have a little saving in doing so. Now I want you to pray for me and write to me. I have book number five of my Bible, Question and Answer Books. I have five of these books, and this is book number five. And on page two, you'll find the answers to these questions. Now each one of these books have 150 Bible questions and answers. Some of the most unique questions you find asked today. And many of them have been asked during my more than 40 years of daily broadcasting or radio broadcasting. And we find these questions answered. What two men smote their father as he worshipped in the house of his God? What king burned the false altar of the people and spread the ashes upon the graves of their children? How did Joab become a famous captain? Where did God ask himself a question and what was it? How many times do we find Jesus kissed in the Bible. Have you ever thought about how many times the Bible records where someone kissed Jesus? The answer is here. What two men in the Bible are termed hunters? There's two men known as hunters in the Bible. For what reason did God allow Nebuchadnezzar to keep his people in captivity for seven years, 70 years? Where in the Bible did a man claim that a fox would break down a stone wall? What do we find in the Bible? A man used a stone for a pillow to sleep on. What three men set up with the sick and afflict, afflicted and spoke not a word for seven days and nights? Where are the first recorded words of Jesus found in the Bible? What do we find in the Bible where boys wore earrings? Why did God say he would send out fishes to fish out his people Israel and send out hunters to hunt them out and bring them back to their land? Why did God say not to pray for the good of the people? you find those answers on page 2 of book number 5. If you'd like to have this book, if you write in and close a gift of $2 or more request, we we'll send it to you. If you'd like to have all five of the books, you'll send in a gift of $10 or more. We'll send you the five books. If you'd like to have two or three, that'd be $2 each. And of course, your contribution is used to help us defray our radio expense. Now, there's some of you ought to write in and get our brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour. As I've said many times, this is the greatest price-wise we've ever had. Maybe some of you on the... And you ought to write and get this brochure. You ought to send your pastor, send your pastor and his wife. If your pastor's never been. And uh, I want you to consider it. Because I've had some to say, Preach Edwards, before 
you discontinue your tours to the Holy Land. We're going with you one year. Well, I don't know what year will be the last one. This may, this tour may be the last tour that I'll take. I don't know. We'll have to move along and see as we move into next year. But all you need to do is get a small down payment. The balance will be due after the first of the year. The tour is set up for March the 7th. That time will be here before you realize it. First thing you know, it'll be Christmas and then time to go on the tour. And I want to encourage you, insist on you uh, thinking about going if you have given any thought at all because you'd be glad that you did. I want you to pray for me and write to me. You can get a list of our cassette tape by requesting the list. We have 350 listed. Tape today will be 360. I'm speaking today on this subject, Eight Works of Grace. Tape number 368, Works of Grace. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. My Bible is now open to Romans chapter 5, begin reading with verse 12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all that have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is a figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also as a free gift. But if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abound unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is a gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many... Offenses unto justification. For by one man's obedience death reigned. By one man much more than they which receive abundance of grace. The gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. That is Jesus Christ. Therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man disobedience were many made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's reading the remainder of the chapter. Verses 12 down through verse 21 of Romans 5. And speaking about the eight works of grace. Now you've heard people talk about the second working of grace. Well, beloved, I'm going to mention eight works of grace. And someone might say, well, have you received the second blessing? Well, I've received many, many blessings. Not only the second, but the third, the fourth, the fifth, and right on. And you can't limit the blessings and the grace of God abounds more and more. We thank God for His marvelous grace. If you had a thousand pound of grace and one ounce of law, and you mix that one ounce of law with a thousand pound of grace, you wouldn't have any grace. The one ounce of law would mar the thousand pound of grace. So you're saved by grace through faith, and that not by the law, not of human efforts, not by being purchased with any means whatsoever. It's a gift from God Almighty. Salvation is entirely by the grace of God. By grace through faith are you saved. That not of works, lest any man shall boast. It's a gift of God. So I want to mention number one, the grace of repentance. A change of mind, a new mind from God. We find in 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 10, And David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done so foolishly. Now here we find that David committed a sin in that he numbered Israel. And he realized what he had done and he repented. 
Now there's times in your life when you need to repent and the grace of God produces that uh, repentance in your life, a desire to do so. In Luke chapter 13, verses 3 through 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He tells us here in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. Now there must be a repentance. Repentance, of course, and believing on Christ go hand in hand. You can't separate the two. A repentance is changing your mind about your life or where you're going or your condition or your position. You've changed your mind. You've come to the place where you want to be saved. And repentance is changing your mind about your sin, your past life. And you're willing to turn your back upon it and receive Christ. That's repentance. I believe in old-fashioned repentance. I don't think that uh, this little easy believism today is going to do the job. Now you have some men today, even some preachers that say, Well, you don't need to repent in this day in which we live. Repentance was for Israel. I disagree with that. The Bible said we need to repent. God has granted repentance the salvation of the Gentiles, the Bible tells us. And I think a person must need to repent in order to be saved. If you say, well, I'll come down and get saved. I'm not sorry for my sins. I'm not sorry for my past life. And I'm going to get saved and go on and live the same old life. You think God's going to save you? Absolutely not. There must be some repentance in your heart. You must be sorry about your sins, your past life. And you'd like for God to do something about it. And God will do something about it. Secondly, there's a grace of conversion. A changed life or a new life from God. That is coming by the grace of God. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3. Fairly I say unto you, except you be converted and become a, as little children, you shall enter into the kingdom of God. He tells us in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the Lord. There's a conversion, a change of life, a new life, by the power of God. That comes by the grace of God. You're converted, you're changed, you're now a, a different person. You're headed in a different direction because you've been converted. Now you need to realize that conversion is something very important. That's what happens to you. When you come to know God, you have been converted. You have been changed. You have a new life by the grace of God. And that new life comes from God. It's all by God's marvelous grace. The number three, that's regeneration. That's a change of nature, a new nature from God. Regeneration. Regenerating. A quickening or starting over or beginning new. Regenerating. And that's what happens when you get saved. You have a natural life. And you have the spirit of man. But there must be a regenerating. Oftentimes people that deal with motors and things of that type. Will maybe connect a couple of wires and start things rolling. Start things moving. And uh, produce power and so forth. Now there's a, a regenerating in the life of a man. And every man today that's unsaved needs to be regenerated. Needs to be cranked up as it were. He needs to be quickened. He needs to be made new by the power of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore if any man be in Christ he's a new creature. Old things are passed away but all things are become new. Now the man without God is dead. He's dead in trespasses in that he's trespassed the law of God. And he's dead in sins in that he was born in sin. And he has to be quickened, made alive. If a man is dead, then he needs to be made alive. And you must be made alive, spiritually speaking, or you won't go to heaven. And that's what happens when you get saved, and that comes by the grace of God. Now Jesus uh, gives Nicodemus an illustration in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Then speaking about the new birth, a man is made new by regeneration. 
as so man is made alive. As we face people today, we are speaking to dead people spiritually and alive people spiritually. If you have been saved, you're alive. If you haven't been saved, you're dead. Now, when I say dead, I mean dead spiritually. You're, you're alive physically. You have the spirit of man. You have life in you, but you're not connected up. You don't belong to God. You haven't been quickened and made alive by the spirit of God. And you definitely have to be connected up by the Spirit of God, regenerated. Uh, you are going on in your sins, a dead person. All the people that out in the world without God are dead in trespass and dead in sins. But the saved people have been regenerated. They have been quickened. They have been made alive by the power of God. And that's an act of the grace of God. And so we know, know we must be regenerated or we are lost. You may say, preach, I'll stop cussing out loud. I'll join the church. I'll be baptized. I'll receive the communion and thus and thus. Well, that's not regeneration. Now, those things you should do, but you must be regenerated first. Regenerated by the grace and power of God Almighty. Number four, that is the grace of justification. A change of state, a new standing before God. Now that word justify simply means just as though I had never sinned. Now that's what happens when you get saved. You become justified the moment you're saved. Whenever you get saved, God blots out your past life, your past sins. God sees you as white as snow. God sees you as though you would never done anything wrong. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 39, By him that believed are uh, justified from all things in which could not be justified by the law of Moses. That's Acts chapter 13 verse 39. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to get this picture because you'd be surprised at the people today they think when they come to die, then their good deeds will be measured against their bad deeds. And if they have more good deeds than bad deeds, they go to heaven. If they have more bad deeds than good, they go to hell. And a lot of people actually believe that. Beloved, listen to me. When God saves a person, God justifies that person and God washes him with his precious blood. And God blots out his old past life. And God starts a new slate, a new leaf, a new life. And whenever you're saved, God blots out your life from the time you were born in the world to the time you were saved, and there God starts all over again. Now that new life, that new slate, that new book that God is writing is the one you face at the judgment seat of Christ. And God sees you just as though you had never committed a sin. Now, I want that to sink in. God sees you as though you had never committed a sin. Now I was justified or saved at the age of 21. And when God saved me, God blotted out my entire record from the time I came into the world until I was saved at the age of 21. That went under the blood. I'll never have to face that again. Now God started a new record of my life at the age of 21, which he will keep as long as I stay in this body. But the old record is gone. Now the blood of Jesus Christ atones for the soul, but not for harvest. And let me explain that. As a man, for instance, he lived a righty life. He's a drunk maybe and a fighter and a cusser. And he goes out and he gets in a fight and he loses maybe one of his eyes in a fight. And then he, of course, he gets saved. God does restore that eyesight back. No, sir. That's a harvest. He's reaping of his sins. But God atoned and blotted out those sins that was held against that man. Although as long as he's in that body, he'll have to reap that and carry that with him the rest of his days as a result of his sins he committed back before he got saved. But God doesn't hold that against him. God doesn't hold anything against him before his salvation. Everything is blotted out. Man has to suffer that himself. God doesn't hold against that man. He only has one eye. 
He'll have to go ahead the rest of his life with just one eye and he'll have to suffer that. God doesn't hold that against him. God will use him just like he'd use anyone else, but he's reaping a harvest he sowed of his wild oaks back before he got saved, but they're not held against him by the Lord. That's the means of justification. God looks down upon him just as though he had never done anything wrong in his life. I may be speaking to someone out in the radio listening audience. You've lived a pretty rough life. Maybe you out last night uh, living it up. Out drinking and carrying on. Maybe cursing and gambling and so forth. And you feel mighty bad about it today. And as you look back over your life, you realize what a mess you've made of it. And you wonder what in the world can you do. Maybe your wife's already told you she's going to leave you. Take the children and leave you because you're so mean and ungodly or vice versa there with the wife. But um, uh, you may say, preacher, our lives in a mess. What can we do? Well, come to God. Let God clean the slate. And God Almighty will blot out all those past sins. And God will see you as though you had never done anything wrong in your life. That's how wonderful God is. And that's God's grace. Then another act of the grace of God is adoption, number five. A change of family, a new relationship with God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, that Jesus came unto his own, that is, unto the Jews, and they received him not. They said, we'll not have this man to reign over us. Caesar's our king, we don't want this man. But he goes on to say, but to as many... As receive him, them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Right then and there, when you're converted, you're adopted, or you're born into the family of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, Heaven predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pledge of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the Beloved. See, you're born into a family. Back many years ago, your mother gave birth to you, and you were born into that family. Whatever the name is, you were born in that family. One day, whenever you got saved, you were born again. You were born into God's family. Now, you belong today as a saved person in the family of God. You got in that family by a spiritual birth. You got into your own family, whether it be Jones or Smith or Edwards or whatnot. You got into that family by a physical birth. But you got into the family of God by a spiritual birth. And if you haven't been born into that family, adopted into that family, you're still lost. Oh, you may say now, Preacher Edwards, I joined the church. I was christened. I was sprinkled or I was baptized. I've been to church, I've been a good person, and I've lived a good, clean life. That's not the new birth. You won't find a man in the Bible lived in a cleaner life than Nicodemus. He's a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin court, a ruler in Israel, and he lived a clean life because he was a Pharisee. But Jesus looked him in the face and said, Nicodemus, you'll have to be born again. So good morality, good deeds, human efforts is not going to get any man to heaven. You'll go to hell depending on that. You must depend upon the grace of God. And you get into God's family by a birth. And if you have never experienced that new birth, you lost. I don't care how old you are, how young. My dear old gray-headed grandmother who's now in heaven, I preached a funeral when she passed on. She had a son that was saved over in the city of Greenville, South Carolina. And he was on fire for God. And he came back home trying to win all of his relatives to God. And, of course, he won some of them, influenced some of them. And he began to talk to his mother. She was a good moral woman. Nobody ever saw her uh, out on a dance floor or at a beer joint or a dance hall or playing cards or drinking beer or wine or uh, sucking cigarettes and saying nobody ever saw her doing things like that never saw her with a pair of shorts on not even a pair of slacks as far as that goes or blue jeans she lived a good clean good clean life and was a good mother to her children and a good wife to her husband and her son came back he said mama I got saved I got born again mama 
And I want you to get born again. I want daddy to be born again. I want you to go to heaven when you, when you die. His mother became angry. She said, son, how dare you to insinuate that your mother's not a good woman. I've been good to you children. I've been good to your daddy. Oh, he said, mom, I know, I know. But that's not it. And she said, I dare to insult your mother in that manner, son. I've lived a good woman all my life. And I don't you talk to me like that. And he said, Mama, but you've got to be born again. Well, probably as a result of that later on, she was born again. And she became very much concerned then about the spiritual welfare of the rest of the family. And when she went on to be with God, I preached a funeral. She was down on her knees praying at the time I was converted. And down here in uh, near Diamond Rock and down there praying. And I was over in Greenville. My mother was there by my side. And they was trying to win me to God. And she was praying at that time that I was converted. But she was a good woman, morally speaking, but lost on the road to hell. Had she died without being born again, she'd be in hell today. Now you need to think this thing through. Just because people are good, you have a good clean mother doesn't mean she's going to heaven. She hasn't been saved, she's not. You're dead either. Now there's adoption into God's family. And then number six, there's the grace of reconciliation, a renewal of the broken relationship between God and man in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 uh, through 21. The Bible says, All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, who give to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the transgression unto them, and has committed unto us the work, word of reconciliation, now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ did be ye reconciled to God. But he that made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What are you saying, preach be reconciled to God? See, our forefather Adam, when he sinned, he led every one of us away from God. He led the whole human race away from God. When Adam sinned, the entire human race went down in him. Every person who's been born in the world is born in sin. Now when man reaches the age of accountability, he's got to be reconciled to God. Or he's going to hell. Adam led us away, but Jesus can bring us back. And Jesus can reconcile you to God. There's a little boy one time. Went to the store with a pitcher his mother gave him to get some milk. And on the way back, he dropped the pitcher and broke it, spilled the milk. And he was sitting there crying. Preacher came along and said, Son, what are you crying about? He said, I spilled the milk. Mama sent me to get at the store and broke her pitcher and said, Mama will whip me. And he began to cry. And the preacher got out on his hands and knees, began to try to put that pitcher back together, but he couldn't do it. And so he said, Son, go with me. And he went down to the store and bought another pitcher, much prettier than the one he broke, a better one, and had it filled with milk. And then he went with the little boy to his home and said, Son, go on in and take it in. I said, uh, uh, said, you think your mother will whip you now? He said, no, sir. He said, why don't you think Mama won't whip you now? He said, I have a much better picture than I had uh, the one that I broke. And he went with a smile on his face. And that's exactly what happened to you as a Christian. Adam led you away and broke the pictures that were. Jesus came and bought a new one, and you have a better one now than you had back there from Adam. You've been reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. That's God's marvelous grace. Number seven, that's the grace of sanctification. A chance of service and separation to God. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I live in the flesh I live with the faith of the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself for me. And then he said in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. But God forbid I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. That's sanctification. That means set apart. That's the grace of being set apart. See when God saved you. God set you apart. The Holy Spirit set you apart from Adam in Christ. You have been set apart and you're now a vessel for God. You belong to God now. Before you got saved, you did not belong to God. You were God's by creation, but not God's by birth. Now you belong to God. You've been set apart in the Lord. 
Sanctification means set apart. It's not a second working of grace, a third working of grace, as some people try to teach when they teach error. It means to set apart. God sanctified the mountains and various other things. He set them apart. Now, when God saved you, God set you apart by His marvelous grace, and you belong to Him. You're not your own. I'm not my own. You don't own your own body. God owns it. You've been set apart. You've been sanctified. And you got sanctified when you got saved. But there's also a daily process of sanctification on your part. The main sanctification was on God's part. God sanctified you, placed you in the body of Christ, set you apart. Now you've been placed in Him, set apart for His service. And now there's a daily process of sanctification. When you see things you do that's not right, you stop it. You sanctify yourself. You set yourself apart from that. And that's a daily process of something you should practice as long as you live. Then finally, that's the grace of holiness. A change of likeness without which no man can see God. God wants us to be holy. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 20, 20 verses 10 and 14, but they barely for a few days chasing us after their own pleasure. But he fire prophet that we might be partakers of his holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now God imputed unto you his divine holiness. When God saved you, God imputed unto you his righteousness, his holiness, his purity. God gave that to you and God sees you in that condition and you belong to him and God sees you in Christ now since God sees us in Christ God said we're to live holy lives live clean lives pure lives righteous lives to the glory of God live as God will have us to live now I mentioned those eight workings of grace today and I hope you think about them make a study of them let them become part of you and thank God for His marvelous grace. Now, God's grace is sufficient to save every sinner in the world. I don't care how far in sin he may have gone. God's grace is sufficient to save every sinner and keep him saved forever. That's how much grace there is. Charles Hatton Spurgeon used to preach on grace quite often. The dear woman attended that tabernacle there in England. Heard him preach on grace so many times she'd never seen the ocean. One day she got a chance to go to the ocean. She took a little small cup and she dipped out a little cup of water. And then she looked back toward that vast body of water. She said, you know, I can't see where that water's been missed at all in the sea there. And she, oh, she said, now I see what Brother Spurgeon's been talking about. That's where God's grace is. God's grace is sufficient. And God can keep on giving grace. He'll give you sa saving grace. He'll give you living grace and he'll give you dying grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace who might have found, they might find grace and help in time of need. God's grace is sufficient. Let's stand up. Our Father, we thank you for the marvelous, matchless grace of God. Lord, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by human efforts. We're not saved by good morality. We're not saved by law, we're saved by grace. And thank you, God, for a marvelous grace, grace greater than all of our sins. Use the message today, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As Tony plays, if you're here today and you're not saved or you're backslidden on God or you want to join this church, would you come while we wait for you? Will you come forward while we wait for you? How about it? God is speaking to your heart. Would you come? <laughs>